I'm really delighted to welcome everyone to today's exciting event, How to Change Everything. And that's an ambition that is important and quite ambitious. I'm Jonathan Potter. I have the honor of being Dean of the School of Communication and Information, where I've been for the last five years. And it's very appropriate that the School of Communication Information at Rutgers should be hosting this event. The school originated through the fusing of various developments within the university, including an undergraduate librarianship program at New Jersey College for Women in 1927 and a graduate school of library service in 1953. The present day school is based around the idea of the library as a site for education and liberation. For many faculty at Sky, the aim is to marry cutting edge scholarship with a focus on social justice. Well, the library is not just a dead storage place for books, but a dynamic intellectual space for dialogue and the defense of profound values. Nearly three years ago, Naomi Klein was appointed as the inaugural Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair in Media, Culture and Feminist Studies. We knew then that she had a radical and comprehensive vision for change and one which complemented our core focus on social justice. And since arriving, she's energized the inter intellectual terrain between feminism and gender relations, digital democracy and climate, uh, climate change. The huge challenge within this space is engaging the wider community in these issues with climate change in particular, such issues that are playing out over long time scales are not necessarily immediate in any moment, yet inactivity now will massively impact the next generation. So how does one do this? Last year, I had the privilege of watching Naomi in conversation with Greta Thunberg in New York. And Greta's managed to mobilize young people on this topic all around the world. The challenge for scholars is how to build on this and combine education with engagement to do this clearly and in a way that's not patronizing. And this is the area where Mark Aronson, one of Sky's significant and wonderful faculty has worked for a long time. He's had a distinguished career addressing challenging issues and events and doing them by fashioning books for young adults on topics such as the Salem witch trials, the history of right race, and J. Edgar Hoover and American Lies, with the aim to be to illuminate and educate younger adults in a way that captures their imaginations and gets them thinking and creating. With this set of people that we have here, I'm looking forward to a really wonderful evening. And I'm turning over now to Mark to set the scene. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Welcome all to this almost Earth Day event. I'm Mark Aronson, and thank you so much for, for mentioning a bit about my background. Um, I am first to introduce a little more about Naomi, who is indeed the first person to be appointed to the Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair, which Jonathan uh, just mentioned. So, how is it that Naomi was appointed to that honor? It's because of her longstanding role as a public intellectual. Indeed, she was selected as one of the world's top 100 such outspoken voices. As a journalist, she has reported from New Orleans just after Katrina, from Puerto Rico after Irma and Maria, from Standing Rock where she joined indigenous people fighting against a proposed oil pipeline. And she has turned her observations into best-selling, much honored books, such as The Shock Doctrine, This Changes Everything, and On Fire. Naomi has been the world's eyes and ears, making us see what unfolds right in front of us. Unnatural disasters abetted by human-created climate change and the powerful economic and political interests that sweep in to use disaster capitalism 
to turn tragedy into advantage. Now, in How to Change Everything, she has come to the world that Joyce Valenza and I know so well, materials for children and teenagers. I'll be speaking with Naomi in a moment, but let me introduce my colleague, the great, the inimitable Joyce Valenza. After 25 years of joyful practice as a teacher librarian, Dr. Valenza joined the faculty here at Rutgers as an associate professor of teaching in the MI program, where she prepares our future librarians. She is also the coordinator of the school library concentration. Joyce is a Millikan educator, a Google certified teacher, and an American Memory Fellow. She was selected as one of Technology and Learning's 100 at 30 and was honored with both the EduBlogs and AASL Awards for Lifetime Achievement and was selected as an AASL Social Media Superstar Leadership Luminary. Dr. Valenza has authored books on information skills for ALA editions and writes the never-ending search blog for School Library Journal. She currently serves on ALA Council, ALA Business Advisory Group, and is the incoming chair of ALA's Educators of School Librarians section. She has so much to offer. So now you've heard a little bit about me from Jonathan and uh, about uh, Joyce. So let me tell you quickly how we'll spend our hour together. First, we will see for the first time in public, a short video Naomi made about some of the incredible youth climate leaders she's talked with and how they inspired her to write How to Ch Change Everything. Then we will get to hear directly from Naomi. Joyce, Naomi, and I will chat a bit. And then Joyce, along with Grace, Molly, and Sarah, three wonderful graduate students, will show you the LibGuide they've created. Not all of you know the term LibGuide, but soon you will. The LibGuide they have created to work with and enhance the themes in Naomi's book. And then we'll have a bit of Q&A. We would love to hear from our young guests and from our librarians but we will be watching the clock so we don't take too much of your time. To post questions, please use the Q&A function, not the chat. However, you will see information in the chat on how you can purchase, how to change everything. And I understand that if you use the code Klein, you can get 10% off of your total order from Labyrinth Books through April 26th. I'll remind you of that again at the end. So, on to the film. I'm Naomi Klein. I've been writing about the climate crisis for 15 years, and I've just published my first book, especially for young readers. I did it for a simple reason. Young people are the heart and soul of the climate movement. I can't, for example, understand that someone can say like, yeah, climate change is very important. And then not do anything about it. My name is Tokata Ionais, and I'm from the Stang Rock Reservation. And what just happened? And now the easement for DAPL was denied. <laughs> when? Like, just now. <laughs> and how do you feel about that as a 13-year-old who just launched a campaign with your friends and your family? I feel like, I got my feature back. I'm talking to more and more youth about more prevalent issues and not any of the typical teenager talk or typical teenager things to do. It's like, what we want to do on a weekend is go to a protest, not really go to the mall. We want to change the world today and tomorrow. So it's wow. just- Wow. What do we want? Climate justice! What do we want? No! media kind of goes, oh, look at these kids. Oh, they're great. Look at them. They're so aware. Look at the children, not look at their message. I mean, yes. It's, it's not, they never interview climate scientists. Hi, Situ. Hi. Um, I said to, I'm 13 years old in New York City. We shouldn't be the one creating the change, but we should be the one inspiring the change, telling adults to be the one to pass the law since they are the ones that can vote. Wow. 
Is Gen Z gonna change the world? I mean, I think we have to. While it is sad that young people have to do this, it is the reality of this world. And we have to continue it. We can't stop in the middle of our work. We need to imagine a different future so badly because how are we gonna get there if we can't see it? From climate breakdown to economic injustice to systemic racism, young people already know that pretty much everything needs changing. This book is about how to do it. Hi, everyone. Um, Okay, yeah, that was fun. That was the first time we saw that video. And I'm so happy to be able to share it with you. And I'm so happy to be here with my Sky colleagues. Thank you, Dean Potter, for welcoming us in such a warm way. Thank you, Mark and Joyce, for all of your work making today's event happen. Nicole Weber and Kylie Davidson behind the scenes making it all happen. Uh, we have fantastic librarians and activists joining us. I just want to thank you all for being with us. So as you heard, uh, the book has an ambitious title, How to Change Everything, A Young Human's Guide to Protecting the Planet and Each Other. It is for middle schoolers and high schoolers primarily, but not exclusively. Um, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit about it uh, before we go into a deeper discussion. So the title, that ambitious title, refers to the fact that climate scientists tell us that there is still time to prevent some of the most catastrophic impacts of climate disruption, but doing so requires deep transformations to how we live and how we organize our economies and broader societies. If those deep changes are gonna include everyone and leave no one behind, then we need some pretty radical changes to how we treat one another as well. The overarching message of the book is that we shouldn't fear the changes that, climate cha that the climate crisis demands of us because the current order is failing far too many people already, a reality that COVID has starkly revealed for those, of, for those who weren't paying attention before. We already know that systemic racism and economic inequalities are very real and that they are already leaving far too many people behind. So the book asks, since so much needs fixing, why not seize the imperatives of the climate crisis to fix a whole bunch of problems at once? We can create millions of jobs that young people and their parents can benefit from. We can plant trees and rehabilitate landscapes that have been degraded for the animals that young people are passionate about. And we can reimagine how we live and use land in a way that helps us heal the deep rifts in our societies by um, embracing a reparative approach to justice, including for our nation's original sins of slavery and the theft of indigenous lands. This is my first YA book, and I was very fortunate to collaborate with Rebecca Steffoff, who has a fantastic track record in these kinds of adaptations. She's written her own YA books, and she's also adapted Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States for young readers. She did a YA version of Darwin's Origins of the Species. The reason I wanted to do a YA book is, like I said in the video, the climate movement is getting younger and younger. And more than that, young people are where the climate movement's energy is. They are where its moral center is. A few years ago, it was university age students now it's middle, middle school and high school students. And it's not just Greta, although it is most certainly her too, it is the millions of climate strikers beside her and all of the young people pushing their parents to act like the world is on fire on multiple fronts. So this book is an attempt to do a few things at once, to give young readers the basic facts, the basic scientific facts of the climate crisis, to provide a clear explanation of the relationship between the climate crisis and an economic system built on the infinite extraction of nature. So to be very clear that we are not in this crisis because of something that we cannot change like human nature, but because of systems that were built by humans and that can be changed by other humans. Something else that was really important to us was painting a vivid picture of the connections between a degraded environment and the systems of thought that discount black and brown lives and put black and brown communities on the front lines of environmental hazard. 
I realize that this sounds like a lot, but I want young readers to know that they don't need to choose between caring about the planet and caring about social justice. They don't have to choose between caring about people and caring about animals because most kids care about all of it. Gen Z wants to go deep. So we wanted to provide a holistic framework that really brought out connections rather than reinforced siloed thinking and divisions. Now, in addition to these goals and the most important goal of the book for us was to arm young readers with hope, to show them the many ways that young people just like them are already leading this movement and have already altered the scope of the debate. So these stories are threaded throughout the book. We tell the story of uh, how I met Takata Iron Eyes at Standing Rock. You just saw that clip in the video. Um, and the story of these young people uh, um, at Standing Rock who really began that movement. Uh, many other profiles appear in sidebars and they aren't just sort of saved up for the end of the book, they're threaded throughout so that the um, heavier material is always counterbalanced by a sense that things can be changed. Young people are already changing them. So we hear about tree planting programs, climate change lawsuits, how young people pushed hardest to put the Green New Deal on the agenda and much more. <clears throat> we started this work well before the pandemic, but added an afterword that discusses how these crises relate to one another. And many young activists feel that they are deeply related. A few months ago, I had the chance to interview Greta Thunberg again, as well as another young climate leader, Autumn Peltier, who is profiled in the book uh, and is a 15-year-old Anishinaabe water protector who, spoke, who has spoken at the United Nations uh, multiple times. And I asked both um, Autumn and Greta what they had taken from the COVID crisis and how it had radically shifted how we all live. Both of them talked about how COVID shows that rapid change is possible, but first you need to take scientific evidence seriously and you need to treat an emergency like an emergency. That's been true for COVID and it's true for the climate crisis as well. Now, a few weeks ago, I was talking to a journalist about this book and she raised some concerns about whether it's appropriate to share such scary information with kids. As I said, the heavier parts in this book are always tempered with those hopeful stories of activism and change. But still, the truth is that I wish we didn't have to burden young readers with weighty topics like climate disasters and racial injustice. I wish that we as adults had protected them enough that we didn't need to explain this mess to them. But this is the world they are living in. This is the future they are seeing for themselves. And it's no good pretending that they don't know. This is the generation that has marched for black lives in the middle of a global pandemic and lived through four years of Donald Trump's presidency. Many have had their lives upended already by hurricanes and wildfires and unprecedented winter storms. They know their world is in crisis and they're scared. If we don't want to lose them to rage and despair, and we are losing too many of them, then I think it is our duty to help them find their power as historical actors precisely because we didn't protect them enough. We must empower them because an empowered generation can change the course of history. Another way of thinking about it, we've not protected young people's future. The very least we can do is respect them, respect them enough to tell them the truth about the systems they are up against, give them language and definition and stories of resistance that they need to act most effectively. I've interviewed dozens of young climate activists from many different backgrounds for the book and since it came out. All of them tell me that they know they shouldn't have to be doing this kind of work. They shouldn't have to be going on climate strikes or begging adults to act on climate at the scale and speed the crisis demands. The fact that they feel they must do it is frankly an indictment of those with political and economic power. And yet so many young people around the world are stepping into this political vacuum with astonishing courage and clarity. The least we adults can do is back them up with our bodies, with our actions, but as the librarians joining us know, also with books, because in the right hands at the right moment, the right book can turn despair into power. Thank you, thank you so much for listening and I look forward to the discussion.
Thank you, Naomi. You touched on many of the things I was going to bring up, but really with sort of eloquence and power that I quite enjoyed. I, I wanted actually, I was going to get to this later, but I want to pick up on what you mentioned that this interviewer brought up about should we bring such weighty topics or such a challenging environment to young people. First, I should tell everybody that SLJ, School Library Journal, reviewing books with great experience said, quote, if you can get only one climate change book for youth, let it be this one. So certainly professionals who deal with young people do not share that concern, that, that sense that we must uh, have a, a kind of protected, cosseted world uh, for young people. But I think there's something else. I think in the past, there was a sense that nonfiction for young people had to be kind of bland, had to be sort of one from the left, one from the right. Now you go write in a three to five paragraph essay comparing the two points of view. And I think we in the industry, uh, like you, have recognized that young people are perfectly capable of being given direct, inspiring, and impassioned information from people who care deeply and have researched deeply. We don't have to keep people in some kind of bubble away from powerful thinking. In fact, powerful thinking is exactly what young people need to be exposed to. So I think what you spoke eloquently about is really where we are as a field in dealing with nonfiction. Uh, we don't have to say, oh, maybe COVID's a fantasy, maybe it's real. No, it's real. You get vaccinated. Climate yeah. change is real. We're in that time of directness. And I think that to, to suggest that you should have pulled your punches is really not where we are um, as a field today. But so now I wanted to say that what I really admired in your book is that it has a kind of clear and almost mathematical architecture. You take us from climate change to climate disruption to climate justice and climate action. So can you tell us briefly mm -hmm. how you hear these terms, mm -hmm. but you kind of build them, one builds to the next to an almost inevitable conclusion of action. So do you want to walk us through that? A little? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I appreciate that, Mark. It means a lot coming from you. And I, like I said, I had a really fantastic collaborator in, in Rebecca Steffoff, who I think it, I wanted to work with her because she has experience um, explaining scientific concepts very, very clearly, right? As well, and has that, I wouldn't have known what would be too much for young readers. Um, and I, and, and I, Rebecca brought this um, sensibility of look, young, young people can handle, can, can understand anything if it, is, if it is clearly explained. And so our kind of mantra was, um, we are not dumbing this down, we are paring it down, we're slowing mm. it down, we're simplifying mm. it. And so mm. those sort of stages, um, you know, I think that that's that that's a way in which we are just trying to build this very very carefully, and just and just and just simplify, pare it down. One thing follows from another. When it comes to the political, you know, and it could just just coming back to what you were saying earlier about this question of like, is it too much? You know, um, my concern is that where a lot of um, where a lot of educators may land is we'll just stick to the facts, the scientific facts, right? But it's connecting it to the economics and the politics that could get us in trouble. It's not coming from the young people. The young people want to make connections. The young people are making TikTok videos about intersectionality. They're ready for it, right? It's, it's, the, it, it's the educators who are worried that maybe they'll get letters from parents, you know, that they'll be accused of being too political. And, and I have to tell you that for me, in doing this book and, 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 and meeting a lot of young climate activists, you know, we have that, some, some video, right. uh, some, some clips. Some of the, those clips were when I was on tour with On Fire a couple of years ago, and I met like that group of Irish um, uh, young activists who were talking about being bullied, who were talking about what they were up against. And, um, and so 
I realized that, th that these kids really need to be supportive in their activism. A lot of them are very, very isolated. You know, I, it looks like there's this huge movement and there is, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it's just a few kids in each school, you know? Right. And, and I wanted to valorize their work and say, this is incredible. This is part of this huge global movement. And, and, and part of what motivated me was Greta's story and her mm -hmm. sharing that when she just heard the facts of climate change, you know, from documentaries and books that just said, hey, the world is on fire, but we're not going to talk about politics or activism. Right. It, it was devastating for her, right? Because, right. because she, if, if the house is on fire, you have to act, right? right? And so the idea that we're going to kind of compromise by just talking about the science, but not talking about politics, I actually think it's pretty, um, it's, it's, this is what I mean by we didn't protect these young people, so we have to empower them because this information is, is actually terrifying for young people. And if there isn't a plan about what to do about it, what they can do right. about it, they're going to be very, very scared. Right. Well, actually, this actually leads to one of my favorite quotes in the book. And uh, really part of why I think SLJ gave you that high praise uh, because the stake in this book is not just, well, let me read it and then I'll explain. You say young people are often taught about environmentalism, not in terms of how whole industries and economic systems cause climate change, but in terms of things individuals can do, such as recycling and riding a bike instead of driving a car. These actions are important and we all need to do our part. But unless they are combined with bigger changes, they won't really rock businesses' boat and therefore won't make a significant impact on climate change. For this reason, it's a good idea to always check the sources of information. Are they believable? Do they have a track record of honesty? And perhaps most important, does the source of the information have something to gain from what it is telling you? And what I love there, and what I think really is the stake in this book is, yes, young people have grown up with, you know, species extinction and composting and all these things, which are good and important, but there's a next level about systems and society that it can't be young people's responsibility to change. It's ours, but young people can be made aware of um, and, and can see as central to their story. Um, the last book I wrote was about, uh, co-wrote with Candy Cooper was about Flint and the water crisis, but that's a history of environmental racism. Mm -hmm. We could teach American history by looking at the history of environmental racism. Why do things happen to certain people and not other people? Right. That was a set of choices over time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like your book lifts us up to a, two higher levels system issues and information literacy. How do you tell what's an accurate description of a circumstance? What's a propagandistic or advertising argument? And I, I was so glad that you did that um, in the book. As I said, just Thank about you, my favorite quote. <laughs> just to um, back on that, Mark, I just, you know, I, we, we teach these things in such discrete containers. And when I was reading through um, the how did we get here, here part, I kept wondering about why our education on the Industrial Revolution, for instance, doesn't offer the perspective that Naomi's chapters did in that area. That is an important part of our understanding of why it's so important to change. And the profiles of the young people make everything in this book so much more possible. It, it, you know, I'm reading this and I'm thinking as a, as, a, as, a, as a young human, if this person can do it, why can't I get involved? Um, and so there, there, and I agree with the notion of the hope in this book. Mm -hmm. And but I would, I would love to be able to share this with history educators and science educators, mm -hmm. and 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 integrate this into the existing curricula. That's great to hear. And you know, it, it's it's um, interesting. Some of the feedback that we have gotten since the book came out is that that the parts about 
history, the parts about, about the, the original New Deal, about the Marshall Plan, um, examples of societies that have changed rapidly to solve big problems have been really important to young readers. Um, because uh, that it, it's great to hear a story of a, another young person who is organizing, but they have gotten this message of like, we can't do anything. We're just like somehow incapable, genetically incapable, you know? And so when they get, when, when, they, when, when they hear about history in a way that can, they can apply immediately, right? So it's not just like, it's just like, oh, it's a boring history lesson about something that happened a long time ago. It's like, no, this shows us that, that we can, you know, tra change what factories are producing, right? It, we can create millions of jobs. We can, can, plant, can plant 2 billion trees. Um, we found that's really, really resonant with young readers. Um, and you had the and, CCC in there. I was so happy to see uh, the CCC, which we definitely should have, have once again a version of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we could talk about this for a long time more, but actually I feel like now it's time for us to give you a present uh, from <laughs> SCI uh, to you, Naomi but really a present to librarians and to young activists because Joyce and her crew have created a, a libguide. You'll see it in a moment uh, for this book and for the larger cause of youth activism, youth activism around climate change. Librarians, I always think, are the avatars of intelligent generosity. And we wanted to put that to work here for you, so take it away, Joyce. <laughs> Thanks, Mark and, and Naomi and friends. Thank you for the opportunity for sharing and for helping um, us build something. What, one of the things Mark did, didn't mention that I thought he would was that when we were very young activists, we were at Earth Day, not, we were there at the same time, the first Earth Day in Central Park and we didn't know each other then, so we didn't know we were there. But it was it was a very exciting opportunity. Um, before I share with you the, the thing that we built, I just want to give you some context about why librarians matter in this. And Naomi, thank you for the shout out at the beginning. Um, it's about books, and it's about so much more, of course. So I've been thinking about the ambitious title of your book. Um, Naomi, in the context of our program, we are growing librarians who are change agents as they build cultures of literacy and grow thoughtful, informed citizens supporting their interests and their passions in and well beyond the curriculum that we mentioned. We're growing librarians who are equity warriors, amplifying the messages from your book and others like it, serving as advocates for communities, especially um, human, young human people, their voices, their stories, their right to explore, their curiosities, and their right to participate. We teach kids to be solid di digital leaders, to develop meaningful questions, to read laterally, to interrogate texts, to mediate truth, and to make nuanced decisions about credibility. Um, our websites, our guides, our apps, our social media efforts serve as ubiquitous roadmaps modeling how teachers and students might organize their own information worlds and construct and leverage their own networks. Collection looks different from the way it used to look. It's more than what you buy. It's what you point to, what you make available, what you contextualize. Curation is the story that we tell around the resources we collect. It's our instructional voice. It's how we engage with communities it's how we engage communities. It's how we model a new set of tools and a new set of skills. It's how we build better communities and help build a better world. So I wanna introduce you to our MI grad students um, who have serious superpowers, especially in the area of digital curation. So um, let me open this first and then I will introduce you. Okay. So this is a guide that follows the sections of your book pretty carefully with a librarian's touch added as a layer above it. Um, we have a lot of different sections. I created the one on research and why databases are important, um, the research, the news cycle, um, and also um, a little bit about keeping up and connecting, 
And from your book, one of the things I did was grab, grab the major hashtags on climate change and um, let, to allow our students to um, connect with the movements and to really kind of keep up to date and some news sources that we, we think are going to be useful. But I think we are going to start in, in earnest <laughs> with Sarah who joins us. I'll have Sarah introduce herself and I am going to get to the work that Sarah did on the guide. Sarah, can you um, unmute and show yourself? Oh, there I am. There you are. Hi, I'm Sarah Watson. So I designed the how we got here section of the guide. I work at a school in Korea and something I've noticed about my students is that they're aware of climate change and that it's happening and it's something they're concerned about and want to fix, but they don't necessarily have the context they need to really do anything meaningful about it. So I was super excited to design this part of the guide because as a librarian, you know, I'm all about connecting people to resources, but then also providing them with context and guidance. So while I was reading the how we got here section of the book, what really struck me was how interdisciplinary and interconnected everything is. You know, when you look at climate change and climate action and their history, you realize that nothing's acting in isolation. It's not just the science or the technology or politics or socioeconomic factors. It's a mix of everything working together. And so that's something I really wanted to focus on when I was designing this part of the guide. And what I ended up doing was creating infographics that help provide an instructional voice. And then I added resources to them by making them interactive. So for the history of climate change, I identified four major factors leading up to our current climate crisis. And I included resources in a variety of different formats that elaborate on these categories. Next, I decided to make an interactive timeline for the history of climate action so that you can see the progression of the modern environmental movement to learn about each event. And below that, look at what's holding us back. So for this section, I sorted the obstacles and opposition to climate change and climate action into three categories and chose a format where you can see each of the resources before you click on it. And the reason for this is that I want users to really feel free to explore these resources however they choose and then make their own connections to what they've learned above and what they see in their own lives. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Molly, um, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have started with Grace. Please forgive me, Grace. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, Grace. Hi. Grace, Grace is our designer. <laughs> um, well, this is the welcome page that we did and uh, just has the um, QR code and a brief explanation about the book. Um, I mainly worked on the where we are page. But I do so want to hear. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so here we go. Here's our we, where we are page. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Grace McCusker. I'm a certified school library media specialist and a recent graduate from the Rutgers Master of Information program. I love this book and I'm really honored that I got to work on this really important guide with everyone. So this page is titled Where We Are. And it is essentially our starting point for action. This is a place to find current local, national, and global resources regarding climate change, ocean levels, environmental, social justice, and more. When my students want to know where to get the facts to support their projects, plans, and presentations, I will direct them to the information on this page because this is where they can be informed through quality data, research, and media that's curated for them. The left column is titled information resources, and this is an evolving Wakelet collection that shares carefully curated web resources from leading organizations and stakeholders in climate change and environmental activism. Some examples in this collection are resources from NASA, the United Nations Environment Program, the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the American Museum of Natural History, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and so many more. So the right column is titled Facts, Climate Graphics. Um, this is another evolving wakelet. However, this collection is loaded with infographics, videos, and other types of visual aids that students can use to support their projects and give them professional visual appeal while doing so. 
these are from the same major organizations um, as such as the United Nations seen at the top of this collection. Also included in this collection is climate data from the amazing website informationisbeautiful.net. Uh, the artistically visualized data on this site always includes high quality citations to back up the facts while giving students an engaging and beautiful asset that they can use for their own presentations. Thank you, Grace. Sure. And, and finally, we have Molly. Molly? Hello. Hi, I'm Molly Renew, and I work in youth services at the Lawrence branch of the Mercer County Library System. For this guide, I developed youth activist profiles, collected resources to help young people engage in activism at home and at school, and designed a community bulletin board. Under what happens next, I ask students to identify their own superpowers, how they can best contribute to the movement. I created sections for journalism and social media, um, land stewardship, political and legal action, learning and teaching, recreation, and innovation, entrepreneurship, and grant writing. In each section, I added profiles of youth activists and groups. Some are global superstars, while others have stuck to simple but meaningful projects in their local communities. I'm so grateful to young activists like blogger Zoe Pettit of Cut the Crap, Sydney, Caleb, and Stephanie of Youth Service and Advocacy Group Rays of Hope, Lillian and Tabitha of the Sustainable Fashion Newsletter, and the entire Green Action Team from Lawrence High for taking the time to connect personally and share their wonderful work. I also added resources to each section for readers who want to get involved, including my guide to mending and upcycled fashion, a collection of grant funding sources, and much more. On the bulletin board page, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> no, we're short on time. Um, <laughs> On the bulletin board page, we have a Padlet where young people can share their own projects and ideas. I've also included the bulletin board design I'll be using in my own library to highlight this project. It includes a selection of related books from our collection, links to the guide and Padlet, and space for young patrons to add notes and pictures with their own ideas for changing everything. I welcome anyone to adapt this design for your own library or classroom and would love to share pictures of your displays here. Thanks everyone. It's been such an honor to be part of this project. And we're going to meet some of the students that Molly described in just a minute. Is it time for student questions? I just wanted to say one yes. thing first, if possible. Um, uh, to you, Naomi, I think you've gotten a sense of uh, what this offers, but also when you were mentioning teachers and their concerns and fears, um, to remember that the library is a place that can do more mm -hmm. and that libraries with these kind of very rich curated resources and with the clubs that work out of libraries um, can really offer very rich soil for, for youth activism. But now on to questions. Okay, so Naomi, we've collected three student questions for you. Um, and before we go to the um, questions from the rest of the audience, if we can fit them in. Hi, Naomi. My name is Sydney, and I'm a proud member of Rays of Hope. My two questions are, how do you approach teaching the intersectionality of the climate crisis with socioeconomic status, and how do you continue on doing this work when you encounter hard days? Thank you. So that's Sydney. Right. Well, <laughs> so great to hear from Sydney, and I think... Um, like I was saying, it, it, the, the students want to talk about intersectionality um, and want to, to um, make these connections. And the, the intersections between race and class and climate disruption are really threaded throughout the book. I mean, 
the analysis is really an analysis of racial capitalism, of, mm -hmm. of understanding where a hierarchy of humanity, which is white supremacy, um, created the world that we're living in, where certain communities get treated as sacrifice zones and certain people get treated as sacrificial. And so that really runs all the way through the book. Um, and the question about, how, about, about tough days, look, I mean, we are all having a lot of tough days. Um, and I think it's really important to um, remind ourselves that we're living through something unprecedented. Um, and the thing that makes it hardest is that we are not able to, to be in community and be with our loved ones um, in a way that sustains us. Um, and so we just need to go easy on ourselves and we need to seek out those friendships um, that make us feel good and give ourselves time to rest um, and know that you're not alone, even though sometimes you might feel alone. Um, and I just, before we go to the next question, I just have to just say how completely blown away I am by this study. Are you really? Yes, it's magnificent. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, you didn't build in time in the schedule for me to gush. Um, and oh, just but please say, feel free to gush. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, look, my birthday is next month. Uh, this is uh, a very incredible early gift that I was not at all expecting. And yeah, Sarah, Grace, Molly, like what incredible work. Um, and I absolutely agree that having this resource is going to uh, demystify what it would mean to, to teach this, make it a little less scary for, for educators who might be a little nervous, as you said, Mark. But yeah, uh, drawing on the power of librarians, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, I've, I have had much experience in my life with the, with the transformational power of librarians, but seeing this is just just amazing and I can't wait to get it out there um, oh, and just so spread happy. the word uh, on social media and just just let people know that this amazing resource that you've created is out there wow hooray <laughs> I had no idea this was coming by the way this is just oh, and like because I'm just such a research um, nerd like the idea that you would do this is like this is like the best present ever <laughs> 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 you've made it you've made a librarian or so. well I just feel bad that Rebecca's missing this moment she'd be she'd be in tears oh oh well we'll share yeah. with her yeah we will um okay so the next question hi Naomi my name is Stephanie from Raise of Hope and my question for you is who are you hoping to influence with your book and why great question um and you know, I think that young people already know that the world has some pretty big problems. Um, and so I'm not trying to convince young people that there are problems, but if I'm trying to influence young people, it's to let young people know that you're powerful, that you have a really, really powerful voice in many ways, precisely because you did not create these crises. You are too young to be responsible for them. And everybody understands that. And so when you raise your voices with other young people and say, look, um, you know, you, 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 you adults have, have, uh, have failed in your most fundamental responsibility, which is to protect young people and connect the dots between all the way, other ways that young people feel unprotected, whether it's police violence, whether it's school shootings, um, it can be very, very powerful. And we are, all, we, we are already seeing that. So I wanna influence young people to, to know how powerful you really are. And also know that young people are able to influence adults, um, including your own parents, including political leaders, even though you can't vote. She will be delighted to hear that. <laughs> Both Sydney and, um, and Stephanie are in this group called uh, Rays of Hope, and I understand they've, plant they've planted thousands of trees with their group. And here are some other activists who have a question for you, and they are powerful in their own right. Um, they have been maintaining a blog, and they'll, they'll mention that. Hello, I'm Tabitha. And I'm Lillian. And we're both authors of our own sustainable fashion newsletter. We know that you are an expert on giving advice on how you can improve the environment. So we were wondering, what is one piece of advice you would give to all aspiring activists? Bye. <laughs> um, you know, I think a great piece of advice, um, and this is something that Miriam Kaba, who is a great prison abolitionist activist, uh, 
gives is find out who else is working in the space, right? I think we often feel like we have to, we, we reinvent something that's already out there instead of joining with others who are already doing this work and becoming more powerful. So the, the first piece of advice I would say is do a little bit of research and find out who else is doing this work and then team up with them because we're facing big problems. And the more that we're able to aggregate our power, the more effective we will be. Thank you for your work. Yeah. I'm so excited. This, the students were absolutely thrilled to be part of this experience. Uh, and I've learned in doing this, how many clubs there are in our local middle schools and high schools and how active the kids are in um, eco activism and, and green movements. It, it, I did not know much about this before locally. Um, and I don't, I, I mean, New Jersey is is an environmental justice oh. uh, um, hotbed, and uh, you know, I was really excited to be able to bring my son when he was eight years old to a demonstration to save the Meadowlands from a gas from from yeah. from a, a gas plant, um, and it was organized. It was trilingual and and organized by incredible activists, and they won. Um, so that gave my eight year old a real sense of empowerment. And he was like. Wow, we did it. I just went to one demonstration. <laughs> so we do have questions now. And one of them was from Zoe, who Molly mentioned a little earlier. And so um, I don't know, I don't know that we can get anybody on screen, but Zoe um, asks, what is an effective way to convey information about the climate, about the climate to friends or family who do not believe in climate change or the severity of the issue? Cool. Thanks, Zoe. Yeah, thanks, Zoe. Um, you know, I, I actually think that Biden it has the right approach when it comes to reaching those sort of hard to reach folks, which is really just to focus on infrastructure and jobs and things that everybody is in favor of because, you know, the infrastructure in the US has been sorely neglected. There's a huge need for well paying jobs. Um, and so not to get like overly bogged down in trying to convince someone that climate change is real if they feel very resistant because often they feel resistant because they've accepted other messages telling them that if climate change is real, it's gonna decimate industries, it's gonna to lead to all these layoffs, it's gonna be the end of the world. So I would just sort of focus on the, the kinds of, you know, do some research about, about the, the green infrastructure plans that, that, that Biden has unveiled that, you know, it, it's not enough, but it's unprecedented and there's great things going on. Um, and try to kind of break down this idea that acting on climate means attacking the economy, because actually it may well be our ticket to a much healthier economy. So Daphna Lemish, who is uh, one of our associate deans, uh, posted a question asking about translation of your book. Uh, is it uh, are things in the works? Because certainly, there, as we know, this is an international effort taking place everywhere. Yeah, oh, there are definitely translations in the works. Um, it's already out in French, um, and the Spanish edition is coming out soon. And um, yeah, we've got we've got we've got translations co coming out. Okay, and believe it, Stephanie, who just asked an earlier question, is here, um, and she's from Rays of Hope, as I mentioned. She was wondering if you know ways um, she can keep uh, she can keep helping her community, even though she can't go outside and meet with others in quarantine. Yeah. Um... Well, look, there's been amazing, it's a really great question. And, and I think we, we are all finding a huge amount that we can do online, including the kind of political lobbying that, you know, depending on what the issue is, but if we're you're fighting local pollution um, and fighting for green infrastructure, um, a lot of that agitation can take place online. Um, I know we're all tired of video conferencing, but I've been incredibly impressed by how the Fridays for Future movement um, the, the, that started by Greta, but is a, a truly global movement, has managed to really stay connected and, um, and, and develop their analysis online. 
Um, so I would say, you know, invite a speaker, have a discussion, um, you know, get aligned, uh, and 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 we will be able to get out of quarantine soon. I mean, we, we it's it's around the corner. Uh, it's been a very long year, I know. So I think that's a good place to remind everyone that uh, there is the possibility to buy the book, uh, and you can get a ten percent discount if you use. Naomi's second name, um, which will open all doors, and uh, but also to please uh, the in the chat we put the URL for the Lib Guide. It's there for you to use, for you to explore, for you to share with others. Um, and remember the libraries. That's that's really the seat yeah. where we can do so much. Uh, and 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 thank you. Uh, Naomi, for being here and speaking with us and sharing with us and inspiring us to, to have this event. Well, this was truly special for me. Thank you so much, Mark and Joyce. Um, what an absolute delight uh, and, 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 and wonderful, wonderful <laughs> surprise, a first. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I really can't wait to dig into that guide. Look at happy you. Earth Day, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye, Bye. everyone. Take care.